Okay, today in our class series on simple medieval styles for people that are new to the field or new to sewing, I want to talk about layers. Layers are a great way to get a lot of really different looks out of that basic simple gown or tunic that you've already made, and they're also very, very historical. You can think of your basic tunic and gown like jeans and a t-shirt, except we haven't made jeans yet, so we need to do that. You can cover the legs with loose trousers or fitted hose, and there are different ways to dress those up, like leg wraps. And then we have a variety of second layers you could put on top. Think of this like a vest or a jacket that's just a little bit fancier. Hopefully at this point you have a tunic or a gown, whether you made it with us, you made it on your own, but somehow you have a tunic or gown, and now it's probably time to cover your legs. For a lot of the early medieval period, people were in fact wearing trousers. The trousers have a pattern that looks really weird to us modernly, but it works. They're basically very loose drawstring pants at the waist with a fairly loose straight leg in most cases with the exception of the Thorsberg trousers and a few things like that. They're pretty easy to make. At the same time, they're pretty easy to fake. And so if you're just getting started, since the top half of this is going to be covered by your tunic anyways, you can get away with anything made out of a woven fabric with a relatively straight loose leg, like, I don't know, scrubs, some pajama pants. What you do once you have the loose leg is you dress it up with some sort of leg wrappings. The wool weningas or putis or vikelbander or whatever you want to call them were wrapped over the lower legs to keep them tight to the human leg and to provide a level of tear resistance when you're walking through brush, water resistance, and so on and so forth, because wool is awesome for that. They're easy to make. It is a long strip of fabric, and I do usually hem the edges of these, not by rolling them over, but by running them down my sewing machine on a zigzag stitch. If you have a well-matched thread, no one's looking that close at your legs, it's a pretty easy way to get away with it. You can also cross-garter these with some sort of cording or ribbons, and what I want to do in this presentation is show you how they wore it by trying to find as many examples as I can out of period art or out of museums and museum quality reenactments and reconstructions. Because a lot of this is a reconstruction. It's our best guess. If you're not wearing trousers, you're probably wearing socks because you have a very long gown and no one is going to see very much of your legs at all. Socks from most periods were not socks like we have today. They probably weren't knitted, but they were just made out of woven fabric cut on the diagonal to make use of that stretch bias. You might remember I said this might be in many ways the closest thing that they had to a knit fabric. They were cut to the legs and the foot and sewn together, sometimes with a seam under the center of the foot, sometimes not. If you place the seam correctly and you have good strong arches, it actually doesn't annoy you like you think it might. There are stretchy socks in some places. We have sprung, we have nullbound, and we have knit in various places. Although again, since no one is really going to be looking at your ankles that closely, you could just buy some knee-high socks in a neutral color and wear them. The hose are probably one of the more prototypical, highly recognizable, late medieval forms of leg cover, and it's where we get jokes like men in tights. Some places called them hose, some places called them hosen because of plural, because the legs were often made separate, not joined together in the middle. Again, just like socks, woven fabric cut on the bias, shaped to the leg, quite closely shaped to the leg when well made can be tricky to make the first time. You might want to watch a tutorial, but even better yet, get an actual human being to help you in person if possible. These really can be a bit tricky to sew. And then they tied up to, in many cases, the drawstring of the underwear, the braids, would have loops that you could tie your um, hose to, you could tie your pants up. There are also men that wore girdles. They would be a two to three inch wide fabric belt worn underneath the other clothing that the pants were strapped up to, or later to the doublets, of course. 
Again, when we're talking about leg cover, there are a lot of things that you can get away with if you're, especially if you're just getting started and you're not going to get too concerned about historical authenticity. Over tunics. You've already made one, just make another one. One of the easy things, make shorter, wider sleeves that slip over the sleeves of the garment you already have. A lot of search terms for these because a lot of cultures in a lot of times and a lot of places wore these. In many cases, they made them so wide they could even get rid of the underarm gusset and simplify their sewing. Here we have, going left to right, the 6th century, the 11th century, and the 14th century, all wearing shorter tunics with shorter, wider sleeves, whether we're looking at a Byzantine mosaic, we're looking at the Romanesque revival in clothing that came in with the Carolingian Empire, or you're just looking at a late medieval example of layered outfits. And if you notice in that example, the gentleman with the purple outer layer is three layers deep. He has his fitted tunic, he has a first layer over it that's ending a little bit below his elbow, and then he has a jacket over the top of that. You could make one with no sleeves at all. If you watched my video on different ways to switch up the pattern for the basic medieval gown, you've already seen the image on the left. This is your classic sort of crusader knight fighting tunic split in the center because they were riding horses. Or women were wearing basically the exact same style but without the center front split and often with a little bit more ornamentation. This is our cyclist, our sleeveless over tunic. And here we see it as it was worn in the late 13th to early 14th centuries. As we proceed into the 14th century, these go from being simply sleeveless to being fully sideless. And the Spanish took this the furthest, but everyone did it to some degree. You could do this either by cutting a really wide sleeve hole, or you could do it by making the center panel shoulder width and omitting the side panels until you got down to about hip length. Again, men and women were wearing these styles in both fashions. It's just the length that usually varied. And again, because we're seeing more men riding horses astride, it might be split in the center front, center back for masculine costume whereas feminine costume is more likely to have some ornamentation in the center front, the upper torso. Or, you know, why could do all that sewing at all when you could just take a big rectangle, cut a hole in it for your neck, and stick it over your shoulders? We see it initially as aprons, honestly. This is an apron that goes over the shoulders, and you'll see people holding things and carrying things in it. But then later on, we start to see it as a fighting garment, worn over the armor, often with heraldic colors or designs. We also see the woman's, young woman's version coming out of some parts of the Eastern Europe and Russia. So that's some fun, easy things to do. It's certainly a minimal amount of sewing. And that's one reason we see this style adopted by so many people doing SCA or medieval themed costume because it's so easy. And if you're doing it as an apron, it's so practical. These might look complex, but they aren't. When you're getting into over jackets and over coats, it's the same thing you've already made, except you cut two center front pieces that are mirror images of each other and overlap them. They might be tied on the other side with a fabric tie with a cloth frog, usually not with a button because then these are going to be belted over and you don't want your belt to be pulling and ripping your buttons off, usually a fabric tie or a frog. These came out of the East and so one of the terms you might see is deal coming to calf town, but it found its way all the way across Northern Europe, especially all the way to England. So we see it here as the Magyar, the steppe peoples, the Avar um, and Turkic influenced peoples were wearing it. We see it as it worked its way across Northern Europe. And you'll notice that if it's being worn in a less cold climate, you're probably going to see less overlap. And then we see the sort of boiled down simplified version in the later Eastern Rus. Of course, if we're talking about the Viking era, the Scandinavians, the apron dress is one of the most simple, recognizable forms of feminine costume that you can do. 
has several names. It has several construction styles. The basic idea is that it is an apron that comes up over the bust. It has a couple of straps that hold it on over the shoulders, and it's pinned with two brooches. Often there was a little chain in between those or a string with a number of decorated beads on it, and that's a fun way to bling things up. So here we have it in two different museums, one in Minnesota and one in Denmark, showing two different cuts of the apron dress, both of them with the round brooches. They're often called turtle brooches because it's the shape of the scutes of a turtle. Also notice in this kids, children were often dressed like tiny adults once I got out of the toddler stage. So if you want kids clothing, just make miniature adult clothing. Keep it loose so they can grow into it. If we're young and we're babes in arms, just do a simple kind of calf length tunic for them and you are pretty easily done. Remember ancient Greece had the chitin? Well, now we're going to take that hundreds of years later, we're going to spread it across the entirety of Western and Northern Europe, and we have the peplos, which turns into a big wool rectangle that is worn over another garment, over your basic gown, and then pinned up in a variety of ways over the shoulder. The amount of fabric, the heaviness of fabric, all of that is going to vary by where you are and by how much money you want this person that you're representing to have had. But here we see it in a couple examples. We have a Celtic museum and a Latvian museum. I want you to notice how different the fullness is between these two ladies. On the Latvian example, we have almost approached the apron dress style. Because again, these cultures are in conversation with each other. They're sharing ideas. And of course, if you're making aprons, you could just make an apron. Everyone wore aprons to protect their clothing, masculine and feminine alike. Although many of the simplest and most practical aprons were simply rectangles of linen tucked under a belt. Once you start adding strings to them and you start pleating and smocking and embroidering and having multiple panels, those tended to be an ornamental form worn mostly in feminine costume. And then finally, undergarments. You can easily wear your modern clothes underneath your medieval clothes and go to events. Underclothing only shows a little bit around the neck, maybe around the wrist, maybe at the lower hem, but it is practical if you want to launder this frequently without having to wash your outer garments a lot. They were doing mostly linen. We might do linen or cotton, depending on our budget and what we're looking for. But your easiest under tunic is simply another tunic, cut a little bit tighter so that it's easier to slide it under your main garment that you've already made. These are not necessarily long sleeved all the time in all places and all centuries, but a lot of people do wear them as a long sleeve. We have medieval boxer shorts. These really only show if you're doing hosen, men in tights, that are made in medieval styles. They don't come all the way up to the waist and they don't cover all the parts of the body. The medieval boxer shorts showed underneath the hose when the tunic was rucked up a little bit. Make sure if you make these for hose that they tuck in at least six inches because otherwise they can ride up and come out of the hose when you sit down. And then on the other side, if you want to get fancy, we have supportive shapewear. A lot of the styles that you see, especially in the high to late medieval period, would be very, very difficult to get a human body to naturally look exactly like that silhouette. We have evidence and sometimes it's very indirect. Sometimes it is actual pieces that we have found, but we have evidence of both binding in and padding out. Men and women alike wore girdles over the waist to bring things in, or as I mentioned, to point your hose to and hold your pants up. And men and women alike had padding. We have no extant examples, but we do have churchmen in England complaining about women using foxtails under the bum on their dresses to be, well, a little bit more bootylicious. And we have men wearing these padded undergarment doublet things that make them look like light bulbs because civilian and military dress in England and France were really 
cross talking with each other a lot. And when you have a globus breastplate plate on a military man, then you start to see a globus padded undergarment on a civilian man. And they're kind of ridiculous and kind of awesome. So if you want to do a deep dive and get some of these really wild silhouettes, go for it. Have fun with it. This is, if you're just getting started, how I would suggest wearing these. You already have a basic gown or a basic tunic. If you have a gown, add socks. If you have a tunic, add either trousers or hose, depending on whether you want to be early or late medieval. And then take those trousers, if you have them, and dress them up with some sort of leg binding. And then I would pick one or two top layers. Maybe you're going to pick a sleeveless surcoat. Maybe you're going to pick an apron dress. Maybe you're going to then layer that over with a jacket that is either a shorter, wider tunic, or maybe it is the overlapping front caftan style jacket. And then if you want to add a skin layer. And that is it for this session. The last piece of this series is going to be easy to sew accessories. We're going to highlight headwear and capes and cloaks and satchels. So I hope that you have a wonderful time making and wearing your medieval kit and let's make this fashionable. Let's have fun with it.